Good morning. Can uh, we just begin by uh, giving a round of applause for our fathers and appreciating them for all the work that they do each and every day? So grateful for you guys. Some of them are dropping their kids off in kids' church right now. Uh, what I want to begin is by letting you know something about me. And that thing that I want you to know is a very important thing. And it is that I love shoes. In fact, I wore my favorite pair of shoes to bless you today. And man, I can tell you are already blessed. And not only that, I love finding a good bargain on a shoe. And I got these shoes for $19.98 at an outlet mall in Pennsylvania. So there's no sales tax. I mean, my goodness, wow. Just blessings on blessings when you follow after God's plan for your life, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, seriously, I've, I've found nothing in this world I love more than shoes besides God and family, friends, faith, Jesus. Um, Good save on the heresy there in the intro. Um, but no, I do. I, I really do just love a, a good pair of fresh shoes and uh, think that all outfits should start with shoes and the rest doesn't really matter. Now, because I have this love for shoes, I think that shoes should be treated with gentleness and respect and dignity and love and care. The fruits of the Spirit are not just for our neighbor, but for our tennis shoes. And so, my family has not caught on to this value yet. For them, they leave their shoes all over our house, every single room. It's not like we have hundreds and hundreds of shoes, but man, it, you would think it in every hallway, in every entryway, in every room, in every... And so for me, I have tried to say, hey, there's a really easy solution to this. Let's put it on this shoe rack that dad has assembled for you. That has not happened yet in my children's life. And so um, then I got some shoe trays. We can put it nice and neatly. It's so easy. You walk in the door, you just set it right there. Like I, it just seems like this should not be this big of a deal. But man, it is a big deal to me. I get frustrated by the mess that is left over and over and over. And what I can say is, um, as, as the father, as the dad, as the husband, what I want to do or what I want to say in these moments and in these times is not always, shall I say, God honoring. <laughs> um, and thankfully, I haven't totally lost it or anything on, on this particular case. But uh, the, the truth is, is that every single one of us every single day has temptations when it comes to the power and authority that we have. And I could even say in a situation like this, like there could be temptations for me to handle this in a God-honoring way or a not God-honoring way with my family. And so uh, what we're going to look at today is how Jesus deals with power and deals with authority. And it's something that each and every one of us is going to have to wrestle with, do wrestle with each and every day of our lives. Because we, we, can, we can tend to think this is only like a problem for the bigwigs, the CEOs, the politicians, the government leaders, whatever. Like they're the ones who have the power struggles and the dynamics. But the truth is, is that every single one of us can get sucked up into the power game in the different spheres of our lives. So the story that we're going to read today is from Matthew chapter 20, and it starts off with a conversation between two people, between Jesus and a mother, and it's the mother of James and John, who are two of Jesus's closest disciples, two of his closest friends in his life. And so they have kind of a private conversation, and then as often happens in our world, in our culture today, some other people find out about it, and they're not happy about said conversation. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to learn some uh, great things from this passage together today. And I want you to even think about and see yourself within this story and how you might interact with uh, Jesus and with the others as we read it together. So this is from Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. 
And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, this interaction follows a pattern that we see often over and over in the book of Matthew in the, in the, in the life of Jesus is there's a situation that's unfolding and it describes a conversation that's happening and someone brings a, res- a request to Jesus. He responds. And then what Jesus tries to do is he tries to patiently explain what the kingdom of God actually looks like and how it works. And I will say, like, often in these interactions, you see people missing it. And uh, so for us, we're going to try to get it and unpack it for us today. So first, there's this this request that we see that happens in this passage. And it says, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said that my two sons of mine are going to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your kingdom. And when you first read this, you might think like, man, here's this woman who's pretty ambitious. Maybe she's a little bit pushy um, and maybe even a little bit bizarre because she's like literally coming up. She's like down on a knee like she is begging Jesus, like, will you put my sons at your right and your left hand? And. You know, culturally, this, this, maybe we, we miss this. Like, maybe this is a little bit different of how we might interact if we were to interact with Jesus. And maybe we feel like we wouldn't be so pushy. But what is the, the thing that is driving this motivation for this mom, for her kids, is she's really asking for her kids to be secure and successful. Like, that's ultimately what she wants. She wants, like, eternal security for her children. This is actually made for her out of an act of love for her kids. That's the, that's the root, what she's viewing it as. But she's also missing something as she's making this request as well. And what I, what I want you to think about, just even hypothetically, if you were to be literally talking face-to-face with physical, in-person Jesus, what would you ask for? What would be the questions you would ask for? Because I think for each and every one of us, we want to be shown love and respect, but sometimes we really want to be shown favor and we want to be recognized. And caring parents, they always want better for their children than what they had before. And so before we get too judgmental of the strange maybe behavior of, of, uh, of the mom of, of Zebedee here, we need to recognize and see ourselves within this text that, that we could be this same way. So we've got the request and now the response from Jesus. How is he going to respond to this request that is, um, you know, could be seen as caring for their children or could be seen as self-serving for her kids? Jesus answered, You do not even know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. And and that's an interesting thing I want to pause on. He's actually addressing all of them. So it's not even just the, the mom who's probably having this discussion. It's his two closest friends who are also in this conversation. Maybe there's even some cahoots of, of what's going on. Like, Hey mom, would, would you ask? Cause like, we don't, we don't want to ask could be what's happening here because Jesus addresses all three of them. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. Now, the the response from Jesus could have been many different options. He could have come in hot and angry. He could have uh, come in to try to um, resolve the conflict that's at hand. But what Jesus does first is he asks a question to the question that's been asked to him. That, that's what he asked back. Because what's really happening here, I, I think is a really important thing for us as we have spiritual dialogues and conversations. And I know it doesn't come up all the time, but when it does, it's a great chance to be able to ask conversations. Because for Jesus here, he's not just looking to acquire information and give spiritual facts to his disciples as he's having this conversation. 
He's looking to get at what is really going on inside of their hearts. And I will tell you that if you can ask some good questions when you're in these faith conversations, it can lead to totally different places and spaces. And it doesn't mean that there's not a time to declare and, and, and maybe even to defend, but to explain our faith for sure. But oftentimes it starts for us with some good questions back as we're, as we're being asked questions about our own spiritual walk. Now, in this case, the, the question that Jesus pushes back on is, is or the question that's asked. He, he really pushes back on the questions. He says, you do not know what you are asking. And then he challenges her and her sons and says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink? Now, this imagery of drinking a cup, it actually reminds us of what's going to happen in a few chapters that are to come when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's just before Jesus is about to be brutally murdered. And this is this actually fascinating passage in Scripture that uh, you may not see it at first, but is, I think, a, a really interesting uh, depiction of how Jesus interacts with power. Because what, what Jesus does is he's interacting with his disciples. He says, keep watch, like it's, it's stuff is about to go down. They all fall asleep. <laughs> and, but, but what happens is he enters in, he falls face down. And I will admit, I don't, I don't even know exactly what is all happening in that moment. You could tell something significant is happening as Jesus is happening, as Jesus is having this interaction with God the Father when Jesus says, my Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And, and I love this moment because it shows Jesus' humanity and his struggle, and that helps me. Because when I'm going through suffering, I'm often asking, Jesus, would you take this cup from me? But Jesus also says, not my will, but your will be done. And I don't understand this moment in the garden, but here's, here's one idea that I wanted to share with you today, is that it's almost like Jesus wants his disciples and us to know that no matter what happens from this point forward, it's not because Jesus doesn't have power. It's because power does not have him. And I, I think that is important for us to recognize. Now, going back to our story that, that we were looking at together today is the disciples here, they miss it. They say, yeah, we can definitely drink from this cup. We got this. And again, before we get judgmental, the disciples, I think what they're thinking at this moment is we want to make a difference for God. They're thinking in terms of like, I want to be one of the great faith leaders of Israel. I want to be like David. Like I want to slay Goliath. Like I want to make a, an impact for you, Jesus. But of course, the disciples were wrong. They could not ultimately drink from the proverbial cup because there was only one who could. And his name was Jesus who would come, who would live a perfect life and die a death for you and for me so that we could have right relationship with God forever and ever and ever. He was the perfect sacrificial lamb to die in our place. And for that, we are grateful because that is what results in our freedom. Amen. Amen. So now the reasoning and if you're keeping up with me, there's a little alliteration happening now. <laughs> We've got the request, the response, and now the reasoning. And when the 10 other disciples heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. They're ticked at this point when they find out about this conversation. But Jesus called to them and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the conversation Jesus has with, with the mother and the other two disciples is causing conflict because they're thinking at this point, like, is there this like secret coup that's happening about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Like who's going to sit at Jesus's right hand and left hand? And again, this is an opportunity where Jesus could have come in and be like, hey, 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 this is, this is a misunderstanding. Lead a little group mediation and, and deal with a, a conflict that's happening between now two people, one overheard another person. 
saying something. But this is actually not what Jesus does. Jesus instead comes in and he challenges the foundation of their ideas about success and power. Like that is what actually is going on. Jesus is actually not just going for um, resolving conflict between two people. He's trying to get after the thing under the thing. And this is the thing about how God interacts with us. He's always actually going after our heart motivation because we can actually do external things that look really good, but aren't actually motivated by the right thing. We can even do things where we mess up, but we're actually motivated by the right thing. Like, and there, here's the thing is God is always looking at our heart and, and trying to help us understand and know and act out so that we can be more operating in what the kingdom of God looks like. So this concept of ruler and authority, we, we all have had experiences with in, in our world. We all operate within this, um, in our government systems, in businesses, even in, in local churches have this. Like, the, we, we understand what, uh, what structures look like. Modern day, this would be called like an org chart kind of a thing. And, and I think about this, like there's some real importances to that. Uh, I think about like in a lunchroom, we've got our lunch monitors. I know even some of you here at our church serve as that. I'm just going to say, if anybody should be at the right and left hand of Jesus, it should be lunch monitors <laughs> because my goodness, yeah, whatever you're getting paid, it's not enough because, uh, and, and hey, you're about to get two months break. So praise the Lord for that. <laughs> you deserve it. But, uh, you know, if we did not have lunch monitors, there would be food fights and chaos and conflicts and all sorts of things every single day in every single cafeteria all across our world. So there are good reasons for having infrastructure and in, in, uh, structures in our world. And we're grateful for that. You can even see like what, what this kind of looks like in a business setting. And here's how the disciples are thinking about it. They're thinking of it as like, hey, Jesus is the top. Then comes the disciples. They're even tearing them, themselves at the top of the disciples. And then underneath that comes the other followers of Jesus, then maybe the Jews, then maybe the Gentiles. They're, they're thinking of it in terms of how the world thinks about org charts. But this is what Jesus says. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be your first among you must be your slave. And here's what Jesus does, is he takes the pyramid and he flips it completely upside down. And Jesus says, if you want to be great, then you must become the servant. It's a complete flip of how our world and how our society works. And this is how the kingdom of God works. It's an upside down kingdom. It's different than how our world works and operates. It's, it's saying that Jesus is saying his greatest. He is the greatest. He is saying, though, that he came to serve, not to be served. So what that, what's that mean for you and for me is that the measure of success and power and authority in the kingdom of God is not how many people obey you. It's how many people you have the opportunity to serve. It's a totally different mindset. But I got I to gotta be honest with you for a minute. Even if you know this, even if you see this, even if you recognize this as a follower of Jesus, can I be honest that this is really difficult to do on the daily when you're frustrated, when you're worn down, when you feel like all I keep doing is serving, I'm getting nothing in return. I, I, I get it for me. Like I want what I want when I want it. I want to be comfortable when it, when it comes to the, to the last of the chocolate chip cookies. Like I'm not trying to break that in half and give it to my kids. Like I'm trying to eat that for myself. You know, if it, I can't, can't take care of others if I don't take care of me first. Am I right? <laughs> I think that applies there. <laughs> but seriously, how, how do we live out the way of Jesus? I think that for us, it starts by us serving the mission God has given each and every one of us. It's actually why I've titled this talk to serve in our spheres, because every single one of us have spheres in our life where we have influence. Every single person does. So I'll go through some examples. Some, some may apply, some may not, but I want you to think about this at your work. Of course, you want to serve your boss. 
and, and serve up the ladder, but we've also got an opportunity to serve those who can give us no benefit in return. I, th I think of my wife and how she lives this out as a school teacher. And, um, you know, even if she's buying presents and things for people, she always goes biggest on the custodian and the bus driver. They're the lowest on the org chart, but she is most generous to them. It's an upside down kingdom. Or if you're in your church to serve in the house of the Lord. And here's the thing is, I, I, I don't want you to think this is some like bait and switch thing where we chose this passage so you'd sign up because we've got a bunch of volunteers missing or something like that. This is just the, happens to be the next passage as we go through Matthew. But I would be remiss if I didn't give an invitation for each and every one of us to all band together to use our each and every individual gifts. Everybody's got a different gift that you bring. If we can all band together, we can go further, faster in accomplishing, bringing the kingdom of God to this earth. And so if you're not plugged in and you're not serving, I want to encourage you to do that. And here's the thing. I've actually read statistics on this, that there's like this, um, there's this like mental thing that happens as a church gets bigger. There's this assumption that like, man, you come in, it's like, everything looks good. Like, we got some great worship. We got some great teaching. We got donuts on donuts on donuts on donuts. And there's always people helping and there's people and the kids and there, you know, and there's this stuff that's like, hey, everything's good. And what I will tell you is a lot of things are really, really good. But for us, we also feel like there's so much more that we could accomplish. And for us, it's, it's, it's not even just about filling slots. For us, it's about every person utilizing your God-given gifts to help further the kingdom of God. We can go further faster when we do it together. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Now, if you are a husband, serve your wife like Christ served the church. Here's the thing is, um, you know, sometimes we think of, you know, the man is, is the head of the household. And so how that can be uh, used is, it's, it's my way, I'm the man, I'm the head, you do what I say. If you're the head of the household, it means you're the lead servant. It means you're the lowest on the org chart. That's what that means. We are the greatest servant. And here's the thing, if, you're, if you are a spouse, if you're a wife, love your husband, love him well, serve him well. Even when you feel like he's being lazy, even when he's not listening well, even when he sat on that couch a little too long, love, serve your husband well, just how Christ has served and loved us. It's an overflow and abundance out of that, that we use that to serve our family. And here's the thing. If you're a parent, I want to invite you to serve your kids. And I get it. I know it's hard sometimes. Like, when, when I told my son, hey, could you clean up that shoe rack because there's like soccer cleats everywhere? He's like, that's a no for me, dog. <laughs> uh, come again? You're nine? <laughs> um, okay. But I, I, love what, uh, I love what Jen Wilkins says. She, she often hears the, the phrase that the Bible is relatively silent on the topic of parenting. And, and often on the surface, this, this might appear to be true. Uh, but she goes on to say that this would be true unless we view children as people and those little people are our neighbors. Here's what she says is, this means that every scriptural imperative that speaks to loving our neighbor as we love ourselves suddenly comes to bear on how we parent. Every command to love preferentially at great cost with great effort and with godly wisdom becomes not just a command to love the people in my workplace or the people in my church or the people at my hair salon or the people on my street or the people in my homeless shelter. It becomes a command to love the people under my own roof, no matter how small. If children are people, then our children are our very closest neighbors. No other neighbor lives closer or needs our self-sacrificing love more. Suddenly, a great deal of the Bible is not silent at all on the topic of parenting. She goes on to say this. I love this. She says, recognizing my children as my neighbors has impacted the way I discipline them, the way I speak to them, the way I speak about them to others. 
It has required me to acknowledge how quick I am to treat those closest to me in ways I would never treat a friend or a coworker. It has helped me make my children objects of my compassion instead of my contempt. I am better able to celebrate their successes without taking credit for them and to grieve their failures without seeing them as glaring evidence that I am a terrible parent. Closes as this. Recognizing my children as my neighbors has freed me up to enjoy them as people rather than to resent them as laundry generating, food ingesting, mess making, fit throwing financial obligations. <laughs> oh my goodness. All of a sudden, scripture's got some real clarity for me on how to deal with my shoe organization issue and a whole host of others that I face each and every day as a parent and as a husband and as a worker and as a friend. And so today, the takeaway, the relevance, here's what I, I want to invite you to think about. And actually, I'm going to invite everybody to just bow your heads and close your eyes uh, to be able to get some focus time here uh, between you and the Lord is, uh, and I'll invite the worship team out as well. You know, you, you live inside the, the power pyramids of our world. And, and I want you to imagine for a moment in some of the different spheres of your life, whether work or friends or school or co-op or whatever it is, like where you see yourself on the worldly org chart that exists. And I want you to think about for a moment, who are two people that would normally be kind of quote unquote under you, below you in the org chart that you could serve this week. I'm not talking about just some thing out there. Like I want you to put some legs to it today. And I want you to think about that. I want you to, to pray about that because in the kingdom of God to be great is to serve everyone that our human nature tells us should be serving us. But the kingdom of God is different. To be great is to identify the people who have less power, who have less resource, less skill, and to be their servant. You know who they are in, in your pyramid. So I want you to think about that, and I want you to dream for a moment of what miracles and what growth could happen in their life, and then what might happen in your life as well. Because I believe when we live out the kingdom values, it changes us significantly. When, when we begin to partner with God, when we begin to see our lives as lives of service, I believe that allows us to partner with in bringing about the kingdom of hope to be people who could see new life birthed in others. And I will tell you, this isn't how the world says it comes about, but joy actually comes through serving. So allow me to pray for us. God, this morning, we believe that you are able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or hope or imagine according to your power that is at work within us. We know we aren't just prone to naturally living like this. And so God, I just ask that you would help us to live out this kingdom value, to be people of your spirit, and God, we ask that your spirit would allow us to be the kind of people who could make a difference in this world by not just climbing up the top of the ladder, but by climbing down it to be the lead servant for you, just as you have done for each and every one of us. And all who agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. I'm gonna invite you to stand with us together today. Let's, let's stand, let's sing out together with our voices and solidify this servant's call for each and every one of us. Let's pray and ask God for his help.